Welcome gamers! I am Anraya Titans, the host of the Weekend Game Show, where I educate on and discuss different aspects of game development to show why video games can take years to mint to prevent another Cyberpunk 2077 scenario. Welcome to another Let's Read Some Shit video. Yeah, that's grammatically correct. I don't know why I thought it was. Where I read aloud portions. Portions. There, that's the word I wanted on screen. Emphasis on portions for DMCA and copyright reasons of a couple of books regarding video games, their creation, their impact on the world etc to show the legitimacy of video games as an artistic medium and or whatever I feel like reading at the time. In addition, I also hope to promote literacy as a whole. I also provide artist shout outs to human artists to combat AI art theft. All of them can be seen on the Become Empowered Instagram, all one word, one E in the middle, all rights reserved by the artist. Hashtag create don't scrape. If this is something you're interested in, then you can find the other videos on my YouTube channel under the handle at Titans hyphen WGS and also on buy me a coffee. You can see the link there at the bottom left. Where educational quotes regarding video games and literacy are shared along with the artist shoutouts. Lastly, tipping through Buy Me A Coffee also supports Kids Need To Read, whose mission is to help children discover the joy of reading and the power of a literate mind. 15% of all proceeds through Buy Me A Coffee go to them. Speaking of artist shoutouts, shoutouts. I need to move this closer. Excuse me. So today we have Elliot Boyett and their Ever Filling Cauldron. They have Instagram threads, found this post on ArtStation and you can see the link to all their links there. Don't forget to give them a follow. I didn't drink enough water today. And if you would like to support the artist shout outs, I do have a Kofi specifically for them, Kofi.com forward slash artist shout outs. Any fundage that goes to there goes directly to boosting the artist shout outs post on social media. If you go to the opinions and truth dot com, you will see the artist shout out criteria there and you will also see a section where I have done Tumblr blaze. Although now that I am jobless, I'm not able to do that. That and Tumblr made me mad, so I'm looking for other avenues, like Instagram. I guess I could do it on Twitter. But WordPress actually has an advertising thing that I'm looking into. The more the merrier to get the exposure for human artists down with AI. All right. On to the main event. Again, these shouldn't take more than an hour. Keyword there being shouldn't. Do, do, do. Ooh, I might be... 
Although I might be reading this for a while. Because lesson one. Let's see. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so sorry about that. So again, these tend to go about an hour ish and they go as follows. I read the summary on the back of the book, if applicable. I read the forward and preface, if applicable. If there is no introduction, I read part of the first chapter. So today I will be reading portions of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook, a user-friendly introduction to game theory. No, it's not. I actually started reading a part of this a while ago and I got confuzzled. And I'm, I'm still in lesson one. I think I just need to reread it. Maybe take an Adderall beforehand. And book number two is a Hood Feminism Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot by Mickey Kendall. I forgot to mention it for Game Theory 101, written by William Spaniel. So, let us proceed. And this Game Theory 101, ah, I keep forgetting to look this up. So this is based on the popular YouTube series. I need to write a list of shit that I want to look into because I'm not going to remember it. All right, so a summary on the back. That's quite a lot for a summary. Ha, huh? not complaining. I love reading aloud. People often ask me to recommend a book that gives an introduction to game theory. Up until now, I strangely did not have a proper answer. But today, I am thrilled to say there is finally a great game theory introduction that I can recommend. The book is called Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. Presh Tall Walker, mind your decisions. I hope I didn't butcher that. So, Game Theory 101, the complete textbook, is a no-nonsense, they ain't lying, a no-nonsense game-centered introduction to strategic form, matrix, and extensive form, game tree, games. From the first lesson to the last, this textbook introduces games of interesting complexity, increasing complexity, excuse me, and then teaches the game theoretical tools necessary to solve them. Inside you will find point one, all the basics fully explained, including pure strategy, Nash equilibrium, mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium, the mixed strategy algorithm, how to calculate payoffs, strict dominance, weak dominance, iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies, iterated elimination of weakly dominated strategies, sub game, perfect equilibrium, backward induction, forward induction, and more. Forward induction, and more. Who child. Point two, dozens of games solved, including the prisoner's dilemma, stag hunt, matching pennies, zero sum games, battle of the sexes, chicken, Pure Coordination, Deadlock, Safety in Numbers, Selton's Game, The Escalation Game, The Ultimatum Game, The Pirate Game, Nim, The Centipede Game, The Hawk Dove Game, The Volunteer's Dilemma, and Rock, Paper, Scissors. Point three, rich descriptions of important economic concepts such as commitment problems, burning bridges, and the chain store paradox. Point four, or well, bullet four, real world applications including wars, arms races, duopolistic competition, advertising, game shows, soccer, baseball, video games, and more. Bullet five, crystal clear line by line calculations of every step with more than 400 images so you don't miss a thing. Last bullet, new 2014-2015 edition now includes duels, the median voter theorem, hoteling game, 
Hotelling's Game, Second Price Auctions, and Coronaut Competition. Coronaut? Or is it Corno? Hmm. C O U R N O T. Quick, efficient, and to the point, Game Theory 101, the complete textbook, is perfect for students of introductory game theory, intermediate microeconomics, international relations, and political science. William Spaniel is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Rochester and the creator of the popular YouTube series Game Theory 101. You can email him at williamspaniel at gmail.com or follow him on Twitter at Game Theory 101. It's getting hot in here. All right, so this sucker jumps straight into the lessons. So what I'm going to do, cause, oh, we've only been, that took me 11 minutes, cool. Well, just reading to the end of that. So, according to the table of context, we have Lesson 1.1, The Prisoner's Dilemma and Strict Dominance. So, I'm going to read that. It's 12 pages long. That's fine. Because that's where I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> or, it, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not 12 pages long, it's 15 pages long. Lesson 1.2 starts on page 15. So we'll go through lesson 1.1, the prisoner's dilemma and strict dominance. So first part, solving the prisoner's dilemma, then the meaning of the numbers and the role of game theory, applications of the prisoner's dilemma, deadlock, strict dominance, and asymmetric games. I don't know how well this will go for anyone listening Without the, I guess I can describe the graphics. I'll do that to the best of my ability. So, lesson 1.1. The Prisoner's Dilemma and Strict Dominance. How many times have I said that already? At its core, game theory is the study of strategic interdependence. That is, situations where my actions affect both my welfare and your welfare and vice versa. Strategic interdependence is tricky as actors need to anticipate, act, and react. Blissful ignorance will not cut it. The prisoner's dilemma is the oldest and most studied model in game theory, and its solution concept is also the simplest. As such, we will start with it. Two thieves can't plan to rob an electronic store. As they approach the back door, the police arrest them for trespassing. The cops suspect that the pair plan to break in, but lack the evidence to support such an accusation. They, therefore, require a confession to charge the suspects with the greater crime. Having studied game theory in college, the interrogator throws them into the prisoner's dilemma. He individually sequesters both robbers and tells each of them the following. We are currently charging you with trespassing which implies a one-month jail sentence. I know you're planning on robbing the store, but right now I cannot prove it. I need your testimony. In exchange for your cooperation, I will dismiss your trespassing charge and your partner will be charged to the full extent of the law, a 12-month jail sentence. I'm offering your partner the same deal. If both of you confess, your individual testimony is no longer as valuable and your jail sentence will be eight months each. If both criminals are self-interested and only care about minimizing their jail time, should they take the interrogator's deal? Whew. So, solving the prisoner's dilemma. The story contains a lot of information. Luckily, we can condense everything we need to know into a simple matrix, so I will describe it. So, up top, so it's two rows, two columns. So on the top, we have quiet on the left, 
confess on the right. That's for the columns, for the rows, quiet on top, confess on bottom. I'm pretty sure they're going to explain what the numbers mean. So if they both stay quiet, it's negative one, negative one. If one stays quiet, one confesses, it's negative 12, zero. Oh, that's for the first one. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so if... Actually, no, it doesn't. Oh, okay. I had to read the next paragraph to understand what it was I was looking at. So I'll just give you the numbers. So, negative 1, negative 1, negative 12, 0, top row. Bottom row, 0, negative 12, negative 8, negative 8. That's if they both confess. So, we will use this type of games metrics regularly, so it is important to understand how to interpret it. I don't. <laughs> okay, there are two players in this game. The first player strategies, keep quiet and confess, are in the rows. And the second player strategies are in the columns. Okay. That doesn't help. So I hope that helps you. The first player's payoffs are listed first for each outcome. And the second players are listed second. For example, if the first player keeps quiet and the second player confesses, then the game ends in the top right set of payoffs. The first player received 12 months of jail time and the second player received zero. Finally, as a matter of convention, we refer to the first player as a man and the second player as a woman. We this will allow us to utilize pronouns like he and she instead of endlessly repeating player one and player two. Which strategy should each player choose? To see the answer, we must look at each move in isolation. Consider the game from player one's perspective. Suppose he knew player two will keep quiet. How should he respond? Let's focus on the important information in that context. Since player one only cares about his jail time, he can block out player two's payoffs with question marks. Player one should confess. If he keeps quiet, he will spend one month in jail, but if he confesses, he walks away. Since he prefers less jail time to more jail time, confession produces his best outcome. Note that player two's payoffs are completely irrelevant to player one's decision in this context. If he knows that she will keep quiet, then he only needs to look at his own payoffs to decide which strategy to pick. Thus, the question marks could be any number at all, and player one's optimal decision given player two's move will remain the same. Okay. On the other hand, suppose player one knew that player two will confess. What should he do? Again, the answer is easier to see if we only look at the relevant information. Confession wins a second time. Confessing leads to eight months of jail time, whereas silence buys 12. So player one would want to confess if player two confesses. Okay. Putting these two pieces of information together, we reach an important conclusion. Pair one, pair, player one is better off confessing regardless of player two's strategy. Thus, player one can effectively ignore whatever he thinks player two will do, since confessing gives him less jail time in either scenario. Let's switch over to player two's perspective. Suppose she knew that player one will keep quiet, even though we realize he should not. Here is her situation. Okay. So, we'll keep quiet, even though we know it's not. Here's her situation, question mark, minus one. And then, that's if she keeps quiet. Confess, question mark, zero. As before, player two should confess, as she will shave a month off her jail sentence, if she does so. Finally, suppose she knew player one will confess. How should she respond? Unsurprisingly, she should confess and spend four fewer months in jail. 
Once more, player two prefers a confession regardless of what player one does. Thus, we have reached a solution. Both players confess, and both players spend eight months in jail. The justice system has triumphed thanks to the interrogator Sevenis. This outcome perplexes a lot of people new to the field of game theory. Compare the quiet, quiet outcome to the confess, confess outcomes. So, looking at the game metrics, people see that quiet, quiet outcome leaves both players better off than the confess, confess outcome. Then why wonder why the players cannot coordinate on keeping quiet? But as we just saw, promises to remain silent are unsustainable. Player one wants player two to keep quiet, so when he confesses, he walks away free. The same goes for player two. As a result, the quiet, quiet outcome is inherently unstable. Ultimately, the players finish in the inferior but sustainable confess confess outcome. Actually, all right. So the meaning of the numbers and the role of game theory. This would probably be easier if you had the graphics in front of you or the charts matrices in front of you. I'd like to think, but they're not helping me, but you are not me. Who knows? Maybe my descriptions or maybe just reading it aloud is good enough for you. I hope so. The meaning of the numbers and the role of game theory. Although a large branch of game theory is devoted to the study of unexpected utility, we generally consider each player's payoffs as a ranking of his most preferred outcome to his least preferred outcome. In the prisoner's dilemma, we assumed the players only wanted to minimize their jail time. Game theory does not force players to have these preferences as critics frequently claim. Instead, game theory analyzes what should happen given what players desire. So if players only want to minimize jail time, we could use the negative numbers, negative number of months spent in jail as their payoffs. This preserves their individual orderings over outcomes. As the most preferred outcome is worth zero, the least preferred outcome is negative 12, and everything else logically follows in between. Interestingly, the cardinal values of the numbers are irrelevant to the outcome of the player's dilemma. For example, suppose we change the matrix payoff to this, 33144122. Here, we've replaced the months of jail time with an ordering of most to least preferred outcomes, with four representing a player's most preferred outcome and one representing a player's least preferred outcome. In other words, player one would most like to reach the confess quiet outcome, then the quiet quiet outcome, then the confess confess outcome, then the quiet confess outcome. All right. Even with these changes, confess is still always better than keep quiet. To see this, suppose, suppose player two kept quiet. Player one should confess since four beats three. Likewise, suppose player two confessed. Then player one should still confess as two beats one. With the, the same is true for player two. First, suppose player one kept quiet. Player two ought to confess since four beats three. Alternatively, if player one confessed, player two should confess as well, as two is greater than one. Thus, regardless of what the other player does, each player's best strategy is to confess. To be clear, this preference ordering exclusively over time spent in jail is just one way the players may interpret the situation. Suppose you and a friend were actually arrested and the interrogator offered you a similar deal. The results here do not generally tell you what to do in that situation unless you and your friend only cared about jail time. Perhaps your friend is strong and both of you value it more than avoiding jail time. Your friendship is strong. Wow. Since confessing might destroy the friendship, you could prefer to keep quiet if your partner kept quiet, which changes the ranking of your outcomes. Your preferences here are perfectly rational. Perfectly rational. 
However, we do not yet have the tools to solve the corresponding game. We will reconsider these alternative sets of preferences in Lesson 1.3. I don't think I'm reading that far. Indeed, the possibility of alternative preferences highlights game theory's rule in making predictions about the world. In general, we take a three-step approach. One, make assumptions. Two, do the math. Three, draw some conclusions. Eep. Stop it. Okay. We do steps one and three every day. However, absent rigorous logic, some conclusions we draw may not actually follow from our assumptions. We all know what people say about assumptions, don't we? Game theory, the math from step two that this book covers, provides a rigorous way of ensuring that our conclusions follow directly from the assumptions. Hmm. Thus, correct assumptions imply correct conclusions, but incorrect assumptions could lead to ridiculous claims. As such, we must be careful and precise about the assumptions we make, and we should not be surprised if our conclusions change based on the assumptions we make. Nevertheless, for the given payoffs in the prisoner's dilemma, we have seen an example of strict dominance. We say that a strategy X strictly dominates strategy Y for a player. If strategy X provides a greater payoff for that player, then strategy Y, regardless of what the other player does. Did I say players? Other players do. In this example, confessing strictly dominated keeping quiet for both players. Unsurprisingly, players never optimally select strictly dominated strategies. By definition, a better option always exists regardless of what the other players do. Whew. I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting a headache. I'm um, switching to hood feminism, but everyone, again, this is Game Theory 101, the complete de text book, I can talk, based on the popular YouTube series, book written by William Spaniel. When I put this on YouTube, there will be links to the book in the description, a link to the book in the description. Though there will be links to both books and they will be affiliate links, so you know. Love y'all so much. So, Hood Feminism, notes from the women that a movement forgot by Mickey Kendall. Their summary is on the book cover. As in the paper one, what is that called? Sleeve, that's the sleeve. And their summary is actually on the inside of the, oh, it's the jacket. So what are all these damn things? So there's a sleeve, a jacket. All right. So here is the summary. Today's feminist movement has a glaring blind spot and paradoxically, it is women. Mainstream feminists really discuss meeting basic needs as a feminist issue, argues Mickey Kendall, but food security, access to quality education, safe neighborhoods, living wage, and medical care are all feminist issues. All too often, the focus is not on basic survival for the many, instead it is on increasing privilege for the few. Prominent white feminists broadly suffer from their own myopia with regard to how things like race, class, sexual orientation, and ability intersect with gender. How can we stand in solidarity as a movement, Kendall asks, when there is the distinct likelihood that some women are oppressing others? In this potent and electrifying critique of today's feminist movement, thank you, Mickey Kendall draws on her own experiences with hunger, violence, and hypersexualization along with incisive commentary on politics, pop culture, the stigma of mental health, and more. 
I wish I had read this part first. Trigger warning. Hood feminism is a ferocious clarion call to all would-be feminists to live out the true mandate of the movement in thought and in deed. Ricky Kendall. As a writer, speaker, and blogger whose work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, The Guardian, Time, Salon, Ebony, Essence, and elsewhere, she has discussed race, feminism, violence in Chicago, tech, pop culture, and social media on NPR's Tell Me More, Al Jazeera's The Listening Post, and BBC's Women's Hour, as well as universities across the country. She co-edited the Locus Award-nominated anthology Hidden Youth and is part of the Hugo Award-nominated team of editors at Fireside Magazine, a veteran she lives in Chicago with her family. Good feminism. And there is an introduction. My grandmother would not have described herself as a feminist. Born in 1924 after white women won the right to vote, but raised in the height of Jim Crow America, she did not think of white women as allies or sisters. She held firmly to her belief in certain gender roles and had no patience for debates over whether women should work when that conversation arose after World War II. She always worked, like her four mothers before her, and when my grandfather wanted her to stop working outside their home and let him be the primary breadwinner, well, that seemed like the most logical thing in the world to her. Because she was tired, and working at home to care for her children was no different from her working outside the home. To her mind, all women had to work. It was just a question of how much and where you were doing it. Hmm. Besides, like a lot of women of that era, she had her own creative and sometimes less than legal ways of making money from home, and she utilized them all as the need arose. She mandated education for her four daughters, who gave her six grandchildren between them, and for any number of cousins, friends, and neighborhood children around, the mandate was the same. Her answer to almost every question or everything was go to school. It never occurred to any of us that dropping out was an option because not only was her wrath to be feared, her wisdom was always respected. High school was mandatory. Some college strongly encouraged and your gender didn't matter a bit. As with work, education was something she believed everyone needed to have and she didn't care how you got it or how far you went as long as you could take care of yourself. My grandmother remains, despite her futile efforts to make me more ladylike, one of the most feminist women I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, and yet she would never have carried that label, because so much of what feminists had to say of her time was laden with racist and classist assumptions about women like her. She focused on what she could control and was openly disdainful of a, of a lot of feminist rhetoric, but she lived her feminism and her priorities were in line with womanist views on individual and community health. She taught me that being able to survive, to take care of myself and those I loved, was arguably more important than being concerned with respectability. Feminism, as defined by the priorities of white women, hinged on the availability of cheap labor in the home from women of color. Going into a white woman's kitchen did nothing to help other women. Those jobs had always been available, always paid poorly, always been dangerous. Freedom was not to be found in doing the same labor with a thin veneer of access to opportunities that would most likely never come. A better deal for white women could not be, would not be, the road to freedom for black women. She taught me to be critical of any ideology that claimed to know best if those espousing it didn't listen to me about what I wanted, much less needed. She taught me distrust. What progressives who ignore history don't understand 
is that just like racism is taught, so is distrust, especially in households like mine, where parents and grandparents who had lived through Jim Crow, Cointelpro, Reaganomics, and the war on drugs talk to their children early and often about how to stay out of trouble. When the cops harassed you, but didn't bother to actually protect and serve when violence broke out between neighbors, lectures from outsiders on what was wrong with our culture and community weren't what was needed. What we needed was the economic and racial privilege we lacked to be put to work to protect us. Being, skepti being skeptical of those who promise they care but do nothing to help those who are marginalized is a life skill that can serve you well when your identity makes you a target. There's no magic shield in being middle class that can completely insulate you from the consequences of being in a body that's already been criminalized for existing. There's probably some value in being seen as a good girl, in being someone who values fitting in and embracing the status quo. There are rewards, however minor, for those who value being seen as that middle class model of respectable with no inconvenient rough edges. I've never found my way there, so I won't pretend to be able to detail the value or to judge those who can fit into that mold. I just accepted that I will, I've just accepted that I never will and that I'll probably never even want to cut away the parts of me that protrude in the wrong directions. I like not living up to the expectations of people who don't like me. I enjoy knowing that my choices won't be acceptable to everyone. My feminism doesn't center on those who are comfortable with the status quo because ultimately that road can never lead to equity for girls like me. When I was a kid, I thought there must be some way I could perform being good, perform being ladylike to the point of being safe from sexism, racism, and other violence. After all, my grandmother was so determined to make it stick, it had to mean something. What I discovered was that it offered me absolutely no protection, that people took it as a sign of weakness, and that if I wanted to do more to survive, I had to be able to fight back. Good girls were dainty and quiet and never got their clothes dirty, while bad girls yelled, fought, and could make someone regret hurting them, even if they couldn't always stop it. Trying to be good was boring, frustrating, and at times, actively hurtful to my own well-being. Learning to defend myself, to be willing to take the risks of being a bad girl, was a process with a steep learning curve, but like with so many other things, I learned how to stand up even when other people were certain I should be content to sit down. Being good at being bad has been scary, fun, rewarding, and ultimately probably the only path that I was ever meant to walk. I learned that being the problem child meant I could be an adult who went her own way and got things done because I am not so focused on pleasing other people at my own expense. My grandmother was wise for her time, but not necessarily the best judge of what I needed to do. She embraced middle class ideas of being ladylike because for her that was a path to relative safety. For me, it just left me unprepared. And I had to learn on the fly from my community how to navigate the world outside the bubble she tried to create for me. I am not ashamed of where I came from. The hood taught me that feminism isn't just academic theory. It isn't a matter of saying the right words at the right time. Feminism is the work that you do and the people you do it for who matter more than anything else. Critiques of mainstream feminism tend to get more attention when they come from outside, but the reality is that the internal conflicts are how feminism grows and becomes more effective. One of the biggest issues with mainstream feminist writing has been the way the idea of what constitutes a feminist issue is framed. We rarely talk about basic needs as a feminist issue. Food insecurity and access to quality education, safe neighborhoods, a living wage, and medical care are all feminist issues. Instead of a framework that focuses on helping women get basic needs met, all too often the focus is not on survival, but on increasing privilege. For a movement that is meant to represent all women, it often centers on those who already have most of their needs met. As with most, if not all, marginalized women who function as feminist actors in their community, even when they don't use the terminology, 
why feminism is rooted, my feminism is rooted in an awareness of how race and gender and class all affect my ability to be educated, receive medical care, gain and keep employment, as well as how those things can sway authority figures in their treatment of me. Whether it's a memory of the white summer camp teacher who refused to believe that my vocabulary allowed me to know words like sentient or the microaggressions that I experience in my day-to-day -day life, I know that being a black girl from the south side of Chicago makes people assume certain things about me. The same is true of anyone who exists outside an artificial norm of middle class, white, straight, slim, able-bodied, etc. We all have to engage with the world as it is, not as we might wish it to be. And that makes the idealized feminism that focuses on the concerns of those with the most the province of the privilege. My brain was having a hard time processing that sentence. Excuse me. It is 9.30 where I am. Right, so this experience does not mean that I think of myself or anyone else as being so strong that human feelings need not apply. I am a strong person. I am a flawed person. What I am not is a superhuman, nor am I a strong black woman. No one can live up to the standards set by racist stereotypes like this that position black women as so strong they don't need help, protection, care, or concern. Such stereotypes leave little to no room for real black women with real problems. In fact, even the most positive tropes about women of color are harmful precisely because they dehumanize us and erase the damage that can be done to us by those who might mean well, but whose actions show that they don't actually respect us or our right to self-determine what happens on our behalf. I'm a feminist. Mostly. I'm an asshole. Mostly. I say these things because they are true, and in doing so, the fact that I am not nice is often brought up. And it's true. I'm not a really nice person. I am, at times, a kind person. But nice? Nope. Not unless I'm dealing with people I love, the elderly, or small children. What's the difference? I am always willing to help someone in need, whether I know them or not. But niceness is more than helping it is stopping to listen to connect to be gentle with your words i reserve nice for people who are nice to me or for those who i need or for those who i know need it because of their circumstances these are people in there are feminine <laughs> there are people in feminist circles who are nice who are diplomatic with soothing ways and warm personality that enables them to put up with other people's shit without complaining. They have their lane, and for the most part, I think they handle things well, but my lane is different. I'm the feminist people call when being sweet isn't enough, when saying things kindly, repeatedly, is not working. I'm the feminist who walks into a meeting and says, hey, you're fucking up and here's how. And nice feminists feign shock at my harsh words. They soothe hurt feelings, tell people they understand exactly why my words upset them, and then when the inevitable question of, she hurt our feelings, but she has a point, how do we fix things so that we don't harm a coworker, community, or company again, comes up, the same nice feminist voices the same things they had been trying and failing to convince people of before. Only now people can hear them. Because my yelling made folks pull their heads out of the sand. I'm really surprised she didn't say pull their heads out of their asses. <laughs> After the pearl clutching about my meanness passes, what's left is the realization that they have wronged someone. That they have not been as good, as helpful, as generous as they needed to think they were all along. That's the point of this book. It's not going to be a comfortable read. But it is going to be an opportunity to learn for those who are willing to do the hard work. It's not meant to be easy to read, nor is it a statement 
that major issues facing marginalized communities cannot be fixed. But no problem like racism. Misogynoir? Or homophobia ever went away because everyone ignored it? I don't and won't pretend to have all the answers. What I do have is a deep desire to move the conversation about solidarity and the feminist movement in a direction that recognizes that an intersectional approach to feminism is key to improving relationships between communities of women so that some measure of true solidarity can happen. Erasure is not equality, least of all in a movement that draws much of its strength from the claim that it represents over half of the world's population. I learned feminism outside the academy first. You could almost see the ivory tower from my porch, while, but while reaching it was supposed to be a goal, there was minimal interaction from the students and staff at the University of Chicago with the residents of my neighborhood, Hyde Park. For all practical purposes, between the university warning students away from engaging with the neighborhood and the lack of information about how someone could even begin to access the opportunities that the university offered to people who weren't us, the ivory tower might as well have been the moon. Getting a job as a caregiver, as a custodian, or in a dining facility was relatively transparent, but as for accessing anything else, there was no clear path. The feminism at the University of Chicago on offer to the low-income black women living in the neighborhood might as well have been a scene from The Help. Good book. The idea that we might have greater aspirations than to serve the needs of those born into a higher socioeconomic level didn't seem to be more than a fleeting thought for most. For a very few who were committed to a sense of equity, access came with the price of respectability. It was like getting the proverbial golden ticket of Willy Wonka fame, only the odds were probably better at the chocolate factory. Hyde Park has gone through a lot of changes, for the better in terms of services as the population grows, and financially for the worse, as gentrification means the housing prices are going up and pushing out the very people who need those services the most. Resources for residents are pouring in as many long-term residents are being forced out. Currently, the university is slightly more welcoming to locals, but is still primarily intersected in being accessible to those who are or aspire to be middle class or wealthy. I don't know how well the new Hyde Park will engage with the locals who remain the working poor, but so far all signs point to heavier policing and a complete lack of interest in maintaining the area as mixed race and mixed income. <sighs> These days, although post-college me is welcome and has, in fact, spoken several times at the University of Chicago, I doubt that the girl I was would be able to even see the ivory tower because gentrification would have forced me so far away from this beautiful area. It wasn't until I went to college at the University of Illinois that I really engaged with feminist texts as things that were meant to provide guidance and not simply be part of the same literary canon all the other books in the library that reflected a world I had not been able to access. There were some exceptions, but so many feminist texts were clearly written about girls like me instead of by girls like me. By the time I reached a place to engage with feminism versus womanism, the former being paying more lip service than actual service to equality, the latter being closer but still not inclusive enough of people who were engaged in sex work, in vice, as a way to pay the bills and as a way of life, neither felt like they fit me or my goals completely. Girls like me seemed to be the object of the conversations and not full participants, because we were a problem to be solved, not people in our own right. This book is about the health of the community as a whole, with a specific focus on supporting the most vulnerable members. It will focus largely on the experiences of the marginalized and address the issues faced by women 
instead of the issues that only concern a few, as has been the common practice of feminists to date. Because tackling those larger issues is key to equality for all women. This book will explain how poor women struggling to put food on the table, people in inner cities fighting to keep schools open, and rural populations fighting for the most basic of choices about their bodies are feminist concerns and should be centered in this movement. I will delve into why, even when these issues are covered, the focus is rarely on those most severely impacted. For example, when we talk about rape culture, the focus is often on potential date rape of suburban teens, not the higher rates of sexual assault and abuse faced by indigenous American and Alaskan women. Assault of sex, women, sex workers, cis and trans, is completely obscured because they aren't the right kind of victims. Feminism in the hood is for everyone because everyone needs it. Whew. She's not wrong. Put a bookmark on this one. I need to go back and read, go read through the game theory thing again. I feel like an idiot reading it, but it is a good book though. Like, I just need to go back through... It's a me thing. Like, if after listening to me reading through it, you were able to understand it, great. And if you go out and get the book afterwards because you think it'll be good for you, great. I'm going to try again. I'm going to keep trying to read it. It might not be the book for me, but that's fine. And this ends today's let's read some shit also called read alouds I use both on the blog but that is enough for this evening again oh, I probably should have put this in the beginning this is for educational purposes but even though it's for educational purposes that's why I only read portions of the book for DMCA and copyright reasons. I do hope you enjoyed this. Here is the artist shout out for today one more time. And this is Elliot, I hope I'm saying their name right, Elliot Boyette. They have Instagram threads, found them on ArtStation. And got close to an hour. That was about right. And now we come to a close. Remember, we are gamers not because we don't have a life, but because we choose to have many which can also be said of readers. If anyone asks why you like video games, remind them a game is a problem-solving activity approached with a playful attitude, a quote by Jesse Shell. And if anyone gives you shit for your interest, tell them you may not like video games, but what I learned from them is this, no enemies in front of you means you are going the wrong way. Thank you for watching. This will be, what's the word? Uploaded. I need to remind myself of words, apparently. This will be uploaded to YouTube, handle at Monriah Titans hyphen WGS. Is there, can I program, I keep, I need to write that down. So for anyone curious, I use Pixel Chat for the word captions. I keep forgetting to look and see if I can program words into the thing. Monriah, M-O-N-R-I-A. Well, at least that works. And again, if you go to the buymeacoffee.com forward slash mon raya. Oh, you're just going to cut me off there, huh? Okay. Go to the Mon Raya Titans. Any tips that go there, 15% will go to kids need to read. 
and their mission is to help children discover the joy of reading and the power of a literate mind. Thank you for watching. May every decision you make in the future be in the spirit of fairness and may the rest of your day not go to shit. See you next time.